Regular. From the creator of Bull Durham and White Men Can Jump. The club head was waggle the club. Uh. Comes a story. Oh! That's a pretty girl, man. Such an ugly swing. About men and women and the games they play. Remember, those games are about trust, touch, and letting go. Hi, darling. Hello and welcome to episode 48.1 of We'll Review It Our Shelves, the podcast where we review the movies on our shelves. Every two weeks, we'll take a randomly selected movie from our collection and we'll review it ourselves. I'm Brian Morgan, and joining me on this journey is... Daniel Arndt. Well, I'm sorry, say that again? Dan Arndt. You're you're not my regular Dan. This is true. <laughs> so, listeners, this is a uh, this is Dan Hart, my brother-in-law, uh, an avid sports fan, and since we are reviewing Tin Cup, and uh, due to some logistical complications, uh, we had some issues getting the file uploaded from uh, Dan, not my brother-in-law's <laughs> computer, up to the internet. So, in order to get an episode out on time, because we care about our listeners. And because my brother-in-law is in town visiting, and because he's an avid sports fan, uh, I took this opportunity to chat with Dan about Tin Cup. Next week, you will also get the conversation that Dan Bergman and I had about this movie, but right now you're going to get my brother-in-law. Yes. Awesome. I'm really glad you could do this, and I'd like to, you know, say thank you again. Even though I've, I've thanked him off mic a bunch of times, and I'll probably thank him again because <laughs> that's what you. I do. Thank you for having me here. Ah, no problem. So, as you know, we were talking about Tin Cup, and because this is kind of a little bit different episode, uh, we're going to do listener feedback. Sorry, Dan, just going to interrupt the flow for just a minute. That's because. Quite a when we were doing listener feedback on the episode with Dan Bergman, really got to declare my Dan's here. It's like declaring your pronouns. It's kind of exciting. <laughs> uh, I did forget to include some listener feedback from uh, L. Rob Oakville edition. Uh, Rob is our Canadian listener. We have more than one, but he's the most active one and we like him. Okay. Uh, but he had posted a link to the imdb charts about the princess bride and it was interesting because during our conversation should i just call him other dan no regular dan we'll regular. call him regular dan uh during our conversation with regular dan we had talked about how everyone loves the princess bride and there are actually some reviews on the imdb website that are in the three four out of ten star range interesting so i didn't quite understand that uh, but, listeners, that's on the Facebook page if you want to go check that out. Again, we'll give you all that information at the end of this episode as well. So, let's move on to the movie. So, I've already been asked and answered the question about how this movie got on my shelf. So, in order to keep you in suspense, I'm going to make you listen to the other episode to find out how it got on my shelf. But I am going to ask Dan, not regular Dan. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> which would make him irregular Dan, which I'm not going to ask him about his uh, his his bowel movements because that would just be awkward. That would be very awkward, yes. <laughs> okay, so Dan, how did this movie get on your shelf? Well, apparently, actually, it hasn't. Um, I just rented it one time and thought it was a good sports movie. Uh, I love golf. I play golf a lot. So I decided to rent it and watched it. Okay. Um now, Dan and I were discussing this off mic before we started recording. Uh, how many movies do you own? Currently, I would say ten to maybe fifteen. Okay, so you're not you're just not a big like movie purchaser. You're a renter. Correct. I'm a renter. Watch it, imprint it in my brain, and enjoy. Okay. So, do you watch movies if if it comes on again? Would you sit down and watch this movie? Absolutely. Okay. Cool. Because. As we've discussed on the podcast, and since you're visiting, it's not like you can't look at our movie shelf and see 
how many movies we have. Uh, but Dan has uh, about at least twice as many as we do. You're talking about regular uh, Dan. About regular Dan, yeah. Yes, correct. So he's got a lot of movies. I've got a lot of movies, which is kind of why we're doing the podcast. And, and you impressive. already know that. We've explained this. Correct. But yes, uh, I just wanted to make sure we covered that. Oh, okay, so now that we're here and asking the question, would you say that uh, most of the people that you know have about 10 to 15 movies, or would you say people have more movies? I know this is kind of weird off the wall. I would say most of my people that I know um, have way more movies than I do. Um, I have friends that are purchasers. I have friends that are renters. Um, It's just a pretty diverse setting. Did you rent it at Blockbuster? This was a red box, I believe. <laughs> it might have been Blockbuster back in the day when, when I actually watched it for the first time. Make it a Blockbuster it. night. Yes. Awesome. Okay. So, you're a big sports fan. Dan plays competitive softball. Agreed. plays a lot of golf. Uh, I've played golf with you before. That is correct. Um, I suck at golf. <laughs> I, I can't tell you how, how badly I – suck at golf, but it's fun when I go out and do it because I do it from, for the social aspects. Golf's a great game where it doesn't matter if you're good or not. If you just enjoy it, you're out there in nature and that's what it's all about. Okay. Um, and you've you've been into sports for I mean... Pretty much like all of my life. Ever. Yeah. Yes, correct. Since he came out of the womb. Did you have a, a, a baseball mitt on? Um, might as well have. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so... What is it about this movie that attracted you? Because there are plenty of sports movies out there. What is it about Tin Cup that made you go, hmm, yeah, I, I, I like this movie? Um, well, first off, Kevin Costner. I I enjoy his movies. Um, at the same time, two of my big passions in sports, I am a big sports fan, but my two biggest passions are golf and baseball. So any movie about golf, I would like to try and watch and see if I enjoy it. Same thing about baseball. I was a big fan of Kevin Costner in For the Love of the Game as well, too, which is a very good movie about pitching and in baseball. And I was a pitcher for high school and college as well. So mixing all of this in, I thought, why not give it a whirl? I like golf, and it showed in some of the previews some unique Funny scenes, a different aspect of the golf game where he played with a shovel, a rake, mm-hmm. and et cetera. You know, and it was just something that appealed to me. So I thought, let's give it a whirl. Okay. Um, when regular Dan <laughs> yeah. and I spoke about this, we talked about the scene with, with the garden implements where he was trying to get his golf clubs out of hock because correct. he had needed some money to pay for, I think it was the entry fee into a program or something. That is correct. Um, have you ever tried that? Uh, no, I have not. I know a lot of people go, oh, I should totally do that tin cup thing where he hit it with the little, little, uh, you know, foxhole shovel and, and, and all that kind of crap. I did a little variance of it. I hit a golf ball with a tennis racket, and surprisingly, the golf ball does go quite a long way, a lot farther than I had anticipated, and it probably <laughs> wasn't one of my smartest choices growing up. Was it a good golf ball? I mean, I know there's some... Unfortunately, uh, it was. It was a Titleist, uh, okay. and I kind of lost that one. Nice. I know when I play golf, I usually go to Walmart beforehand and grab one of the sacks of basically disposable balls where it's like, yeah, 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 there's like 35 of them in there and I'll probably burn through all of them. Again, I, I know I talk about that in the other pod, in the other episode, but mm-hmm. uh, just for your edification. In fact, if you walk in the garage right now, I'm sure you saw the little bag of balls. I did. Was, yeah. That's, I was getting ready to go play golf one day and some, I think we got rained out or something to uh, end up going, but I've got battle balls on, on hot standby. That's wonderful. Yep. It's lovely. Uh, so I was curious, does this represent sport accurately? Do you know people like Kevin Costner's character that are balls to the wall, take the risk. It doesn't matter. I have to do the thing. It's, yes. You know, yes, I do. I have encountered a numerous amount of people Throughout my softball career, baseball career, golf as well, where people don't know how to take their foot off the gas when it comes down to it and sometimes play it safe, if you will. Um, I have seen some very many success stories and I've seen some pretty heartfelt 
broken stories come from it as well, too. So which way do you play? I am more of a risk taker as well, where I kind of keep tend to keep my foot on the gas. But throughout a lot of my experience and wisdom after playing the game for a while, I have learned to take my foot off the gas slightly. But I am more of a high risk, high reward type of player. When it comes to competitive softball, you have to take a lot of risks. And if you play it safe all the time, most of, if you play it safe most of the time, you're going to come up short. So in some most cases, you, you got to keep your foot on the gas. Okay, so I completely understand that, mm-hmm. uh, and especially when you get to a competitive level like the PGA or uh, Dan's softball team has won the. D League, uh, uh, D level world world champions, where there is 186 teams that earn their way to get down to Disney World and play in that, and we won it all. Yeah. So when when he says he plays competitive softball, I mean he's a, a world champion. Are there actually international teams to play there? There was two teams from Canada. There was no. Oh well, they, there we go. Then it's like but, Major League Baseball World Series. You win. Yes. In the <laughs> yes, correct. In the past, there has been teams. There was a team from Japan and another from Australia that actually has participated in that. But the it's a pretty rare occasion for somebody outside of North America to actually come and play. <laughs> so, so you're 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 just tight yearly the world champions correct that's what they made made the title as just kind of like in baseball where there's a couple <laughs> canadian teams <laughs> yes. two countries that play the game but we're the world champions yeah um but I, i'd say that to make the point that when you say competitive softball it's not just hey we're playing on on a on a bar league With, it's not your typical rec league where everybody's yeah. drinking beer all the time. It's a pretty serious business where we have lots of sponsors that um, give us a lot of donation money to travel, and it's organized, and there's scheduling, and it's a pretty serious deal. So it's kind of in, in in golf, I guess the equivalent would be when Kevin Costner's character went to go play at the at the the pro am. Agreed. It's definitely upper level, like you have to be competitive to get there. Yes. Um, not just a, a, it's, it's a fair analogy. lunk that likes to play golf. Agreed. So to that end, you said you take a lot of risks. Is it fair to say that that's something that Kevin Costner's character never learned how to not do? I would, I would agree with that statement. Okay. So then – The question becomes, who do you think is the better golfer, Kevin Costner's character or Don Johnson's character? Well, I mean, that's two, di- that's two different play styles. That's almost apples and oranges if you... If you they're, they're golfers. I mean, why is, why is it different? Well, their play styles and their views. Um, Don Johnson's character never takes any risks. He always plays it safe. And Kevin Costner is the, on the exact opposite end of that, where he always takes the risks and never plays it safe. So play styles wise, there's no right way, no wrong way when it comes down to it. If when it comes, there has to be a good mixture and a good balance when it comes down to it. Um, but that is kind of black and white when it comes down to it. They are two unique play styles and. Both have benefits and both have consequences. And as we can see, the consequences uh, for Kevin Costner are putting his golf career on hold for, I don't even know how old he is in this movie. I'm guessing Mm. mid thirties. I would, I would guess so too. Uh, So probably for about 10 to 12 years ish because college, I mean, you went to college, you graduated mm-hmm. at what 27, I think you were on the like 18 year plan in college oh, or something. Gee, thanks. Thanks for busting me out. <laughs> I love changing my majors twice. <laughs> gee, thanks. Um, yeah, I was uh, I was on the 6 year plan. I changed my majors twice. Um, just undecided in my career, but yeah, but let's say fair enough. 22, 24, something like that. Let's I mean, say 25 to be exact. Yeah. Um, 25 years old and if he's in his mid 30s, Kevin Costner, then that would be pretty accurate. You'd put him at mid to upper 30s. So, he's been living the dream at a crap hole driving range in Salome, Texas. Ah, I couldn't remember that. With armadillos on the road and 
dry brown grass on the driving range. Was it even a golf course? It was just a driving range. It was right? just a driving range. Do you think maybe he could have learned his lesson sooner? Yes. Yes, I do. But th- yeah, you know, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I think he, he probably could have learned his lesson before, but um, sometimes ego gets in the way. Of, what? Yes. Of, of clear thought. Fair enough. Which brings me to the sheer coincidence in the movie, and I do want to bring this up. Okay. Uh, Rene Russo is a therapist. Cool. I mean, it's part of the script, part of the plot, because he goes to her to battle his inner demons, more specifically goes so that he can hook up with her. But hey, inner demons, that's a plot point to get him to the therapist. The icebreaker, yeah, if you will. Exactly. But what are the odds that Kevin Costner's old college golfing buddy, golfing partner, whatever, has a girlfriend who shows up in Podunk, Texas. Salome. Uh, yes. <laughs> in all the places in all of the United States, in a country of, well, this movie was made in 1996, population was probably about, what, 300 million? In a country of 300 million people, what are the odds that his old college buddy's girlfriend is going to show up to set up shop in Salome, Texas, yes. in the one job that is going to help him break out of his funk. Yes, the odds are astronomical, <laughs> but in movie magic. <laughs> Yay, push they, the I believe button, shut yes, up and move on. there we go. <laughs> yeah. that, I will say that, that, that I didn't talk about this earlier. It's one of the things that in this movie, uh, I... I mean, I get it. Movies are unbelievable in the first place because they're, they're movies. Yes. If, like, how did that? How did they happen to find the one person that could do the thing? Because it's a movie, and if it was, if they just documented all of the people that they ran into that couldn't do the thing, it would be kind of boring. So I get that. It seemed decidedly coincidental. That's movie magic. Yay, movie magic. Well, that's why we have a podcast about movies and why I watch movies anyway. So fantastic. But the aspect of this where he, he goes and, and, and does, you know, the therapy and then his golf buddy shows up. And Don Johnson, let's talk about him for a minute. Okay. What do you remember him from? Oh, Miami Vice. Ooh, that's an excellent question. I'm trying to think. I pretty much Miami Vice is the one that just kind of sticks out in my head. He's one of those guys that has done actually a lot of stuff. I mean – Regular Dan and I usually make it a point to go on IMDb and look up what Don Johnson has done or right. what Kevin Costner's done, Rene Russo, uh, Cheech Marin. Yeah, he, I mean, he, he did obviously the Miami Vice. That's what put him on the map. Mm-hmm. Um, he's done this. He was in Nash Bridges. Oh. You know, he's, he's done a lot of stuff. Yes. Um, he's just never been one of those guys that broke out like a Kevin Costner who, was a top build, like, hey, it's a Kevin Costner movie. Yes. You know, he did Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's done a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, and I, I like Don Johnson as an actor. I mean, you I know, most too. of the stuff I've seen him in, I'm like, okay, cool. I wasn't a big fan of Miami Vice when it was on back in the day. No. But, you know, say la vie. It was a thing. But TV back then was TV back then. Uh, yes. <laughs> it was still entertaining yes. back then. I don't even know. Can you find Miami Vice on TV? Now. On TV, probably not. Through the power of the internet, I would imagine you could find yeah. it. I know you can still find Knight Rider on television uh, every now and again. A great show. <laughs> I don't know about that. Have you seen the? <laughs> have you seen it now and watched it? Going, ooh, can you believe it like that? Uh, but oh, anyway. I was highly entertained back when I was growing <laughs> up, though. But did you believe the romance in this movie? Um. Yeah, I did. How so? Well. Kind of like Paul Abdul said, opposites attract. Um, it's a, a love story where Rene Russo was in her own element, and same with Kevin Costner. And through movie magic, they end up in the same podunk town of Salome, and it was almost kind of destiny how it was entwined with Don Johnson's character kind of being Tin Cup's nemesis, and it was Don Johnson's girlfriend, and that created a nice little 
love plot twist in the movie. If oh, you will. a bit of the love triangle. If yes, you will. the little almost Bermuda triangle, if you will. Yeah, I did like how the supporting cast, uh, Kevin Costner's posse, if you will. Yes. Like, oh yeah, he's an asshole. He hates old people and kids. And you don't really get that feeling throughout the entire movie. I, you know, he's just like the safe golfer guy who's like, yeah, I just, you know, I just want to win my own tournament, yada, yada, yada. Until the very end when it's like, when it's important that Rene Russo's characters see him being an asshole to old people and children. Oh, yes, yes. About the signatures. and yeah. Yes. Do you know who those old people were? A little bit of trivia that we didn't cover in the previous podcast. I do episode. not. Kevin Costner's parents. That is cool. Yeah. Little weird things I find on the internet. <laughs> I love the internet. <laughs> um, but the romance is that. I mean, it's a movie, so again, you know, what are you going to say? And as as I discussed during our The Princess Bride episode with regular Dan, I'm a romantic at heart. I mean, I have I have this this romantic streak in me that loves romantic movies from the standpoint of the idea. That two broken people, and in this movie, both Kevin Costner and Rene Russo are broken, in they my are opinion. Broken, yes. Uh, can get together and make themselves better. Yeah, two broken pieces can find each other and become one because one fits like the other, just like a piece of the puzzle. Yeah, well, it's like, uh, like uh, Vanessa said to Wade in Deadpool, uh, your crazy fits right in with my crazy. Uh, well, good analogy. Yeah. Yes. That's kind of the way I look at it. So from, from that standpoint, um, I, I felt that the romantic elements of this movie could have used some improvement, but they were sufficient enough to get me to the notion of Rene Russo's character being attracted to Kevin Costner and then separating herself from Don Johnson's character. You know, if, if you catch what I'm saying, where no, it's like, it was where, believable. Where you, you thought you were in a good, in a good place and then, as somebody says something and points something out, you're like, I've never seen that. Oh, wait. Oh, I have. And someone says something, you're like, oh, I've never seen that either. You're like, oh, oh, crap. Yeah, no, that's the that son of a, what the hell? <laughs> you were not the person I thought you were. <laughs> so uh, on on the next piece, the, well, I didn't even know where I was going with this. I totally lost my train of thought. Fancy. Jump the tracks. All right. We Jump the tracks. About two broken people. <laughs> <laughs> The, yeah, the, just the whole cast of characters are kind of broken. I mean, the main, the three mains are broken people. I mean, yes. they're, and don't get me wrong. I mean, everybody's broken to a degree. Let's, let's, you know, not make it about being perfect. And, and that's normal. That's fine. Agreed. But I think the, the person who is the most whole, the most well aware or self aware and capable of dealing with, with life as it, throws itself at him is Cheech. I would fully agree with you on that. Uh, because he, he knows that his life is not where he wants it to be, but he's pretty content. He's, he's an easy, happy go lucky guy. Yeah. And tries to make the best out of everything. He's an optimist. Now, what do you think of Cheech as, as, as an actor, as a, in this movie that, it's hard for me because of his past roles in, you know, Cheech and Chong. And um, when I see him in different scenarios, in different roles, I can't sometimes get that out of my head. Where certain actors will play very funny roles, you know, in comedies. And that's all that like an actor would be associated with. And then when they go into a serious role, it's very hard for me to believe the character they play because of the past memories. And with Cheech in this movie, I think he did a good enough job for me to to buy into it. But there was always those trains of thought of, there's Cheech and Chong, there's Cheech and Chong. <laughs> Easy in the back corner, smoking, you know, a, smoking a spliff. Smoking a spliff. Isn't it on the license? Those are the types of things. But no, I liked the way Cheech was, um, just like putting the little marks in the golf balls, being the hopeless romantic... Um, his persona in the movie, it was believable and it, it took me a while to get that stigma, uh, yeah. away from that, my train of thought, but, um, yeah. So you, 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 you typecast Cheech. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, regular Dan and I, 
discuss this during our episode. So I will, I will briefly summarize what I said there. I find Cheech to be fascinating because I've liked him in almost everything I've ever seen him in. And I think that he has grown well past the Cheech and Chong days and can effectively blend into the background of any movie because he's, I don't recall aside from Cheech and Chong, any movies where he has been the, star. the headliner, except right. for born in East LA, <laughs> um, which was kind of a, a, a spinoff of, of, a of Cheech anyway. Yeah, it was a little parallel of Cheech and Chong. But, uh, but he has done some really great turns in movies as a serious actor. And in this movie, I mean, he's not there for comic relief. He does some comic relief. Uh, he's more the, the, the straight man to Costner's, extreme he's a know. ground a quote unquote grounder where it's yeah, Kevin yeah. Costner from from flying away all, yeah, yeah exactly. putting the foot all the way down to the floorboards and every once in a while get back to reality yeah so he does a great job in movies as that character because I've seen him do he's that he's a, a very lot. good supportive actor yeah. yes I will agree with that so uh, you know I, I, I think he's fantastic I, I really enjoy most of the things I've seen him he was also in uh, Nash Bridges with Don Johnson. So, again, that connection. Yet another thing that I didn't realize. Yeah. See, I don't exactly, like, live on the internet, but when I was younger, I didn't go out a whole lot. Uh, I played on a bar league playing softball. Okay. So, it was, <laughs> you know, we were we, we were the, the, the guys over in the corner, like, having a couple of beers and, like, hey, what are you doing? Like, who's playing right field? I don't know. You want it? Okay, cool. Uh, so, you know, we... we I think we won a couple of games, you know, in the, in the two seasons that I played. Uh, yeah, as but as it was, you guys had fun. You know, yeah, we had fun, matters. and that was the thing. Mm -hmm. So, but I've watched a lot of movies. Again, that's why I've got a movie podcast. I watched a lot of television. I lived with my grandparents. My grandfather watched what he watched, uh, A-Team, Knight Rider. I think he watched Miami Vice, maybe if it was on. Okay. But, but a lot of things that I see on TV, I was more aware of as concepts. So, you know, I tend to keep my finger on the pulse of pop culture. Uh, I'm not a huge sports fan. I understood, or not understood, but I like the the foot on the gas thing because that's a racing reference. So, I know we've talked about this. I do like the NASCAR. It, it, he's been my brother-in-law for 20 years, so I'm not saying this <laughs> for his benefit. I'm saying this for your listener benefit. I like the NASCAR because it's uh, physics and science. Yeah. As well as Rex. So, you know. Rex are fun to watch. <laughs> yes. No I always like to see them walk yeah. away from it, of yes. course. Yes. Yeah, I don't want to see anybody but, get hurt. Uh, no. But, but and I like technology as well, yeah. too. They have made them yeah. very, very safe. And, and I like uh, I like sports highlights. I'm just not the kind of person that really, really, really wants to sit and slog through all nine innings of a baseball game. If it's live, I will. If it's on TV. I, now, I've been to a, a couple of difficult. baseball games live, and that's a lot more entertaining because you got people around you to, to talk to. You don't have to, like, watch the game the entire time. No, the ambiance. Yeah. Sucks it's, you it's, in it's as well, setting, too. Yeah. It's the getting the hot dog, the nachos. So, the, but, it's the whole environment as well, too. Yeah. But you can't really get that at home. And being a very big baseball nut in my life, I will agree that watching it on TV sometimes is a little taxing. And more so for golf. And part of my, my dislike of golf is I cannot follow the ball. Like I can hit it and sometimes I'll get a good swing and it'll go, you know, a decent distance. Yeah. And like, I don't know where it went. They're like, it's over there. You didn't see it? Like, no, no, I didn't. If I don't see it leave the tee, I'm not going to find that little white ball as it flies through the sky. That's part of my problem with golf. So. Watching golf on TV, um, yeah, yeah, you got the camera on it and all that kind of stuff. Got the little trackers there for yeah. you now, guys. Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not a huge golf fan, but, you know, I I, I will occasionally, uh, like, catch the last couple of holes of, uh, like, the U.S. Open because of this movie, that sort of thing. Ironically, golf is kind of the similar as well, too. It's my almost hidden guilty pleasure where Sundays watching the final rounds – I would turn on golf, and lo and behold, I would take a nap. And mysteriously, and it has never failed me, knock on wood, but 
I usually wake up when the final groups are on like the 17th or 18th. And that's hole. when you need to see it. And that's exactly when I get to see the finish. So it's, it's quite wonderful. Well, uh, uh, Christy, uh, Christy is Dan's sister. Obviously, that's how he got to be my brother-in-law. When we fire up NASCAR on Sundays. Yes. Uh, the green flag will drop. Daryl Waltrip will say something to the effect of boogity, boogity, boogity. Let's go racing. Let's get racing boys. Somebody. And usually boys. Uh, but at about 10, 12 laps in, she's unconscious on the couch and usually stays unconscious until about like the last 10 to 20 laps. Yep. Yep. Unless there's a wreck and I get a little loud, but usually it's something that's on in the background. So in fact, I perk up more when they go to the cutaway car to show the aerodynamic flow than I do like all the racing. Like, Oh, look at, they're about to pass each other. Like, yeah, I've driven on the freeway. I've passed cars before. It's <laughs> well, kind of cool, no, but another left turn. <laughs> yep. Well, it depends on whether or not you're at a road course. Yes. Occasionally you get a right turn. Watkins Glen. Yep. Uh, and, uh, I'm on the spot. Infineon on Raceway at Sonoma. Sonoma, thank you. Yeah. Wine country. Ah, yes. Yeah. Meh. Uh, but as far as golf goes, yeah, it's it's a long walk ruined by a little white ball. But as long as I can get into the headspace of recognizing that I don't care about the sack of balls that I just spent 20 bucks on. <laughs> I it's a, a wonderful and horrible game at the same time. You yeah. want to quit the game, and then you have that one miraculous shot, and like, oh, this is the greatest game in the world. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love this. Yes. That's what makes it frustrating for me, is when you have that one decent shot, you're like, oh, so I can do it. I I, I can. Why can't I continue? Why can't I repeat this? Yeah, that's why it's a love-hate yeah. relationship with yeah. the game. Well, it's like yes. I, 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 I bowl on Thursday nights, mm -hmm. and... My average has consistently gone up over the last few years because, Yay. you know, when you do it more frequently, you get more consistent. It's amazing uh, how that works. But more consistent would imply that I was consistent in the first place. <laughs> like I, one week I'll bowl in the two bowl a game in the high 180, 190. So, okay. Uh, and then the next week I'll, I, I bowl a 126 and go, hmm. Yeah, well, I guess that averages out, but that's not exactly how I would like to be playing that game. So that goes to this movie in the, in the standpoint that Kevin Costner is a pretty consistent golfer. He knows he can whack the crap out of the ball. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I did like when Don Johnson taught him the lesson about where to hit the ball. Oh, where it's still going? Yeah, where he knocked uh, it down the road. Right down yeah. the middle of the road? Yeah, because that's out-of-the-box thinking, and it's, and it's breaking you out of your... Normal traditional trainer. thought process. Yep. Or yeah, your normal train is actually a, a, a better way of putting it. So I, I think again, Don Johnson's character has some good qualities to him. Agreed. Uh, that Kevin Costner could learn from and vice versa. Yeah. He can learn to take more risks, but Don Johnson, I, I think, I, I don't know. I'm not a therapist. Rene Russo is, and eventually became apparently a successful sports therapist. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, at least in the movie. Yes. Do you think that it's easier to get someone who is balls to the wall to pull back a little bit than it is to get someone who plays it safe to take a risk? Um, I think it's probably a little bit easier to have somebody that plays it safe all the time to transition them into taking a little risk every once in a while. When somebody has their foot on the gas and is used to that, it's very difficult to go ahead and get them to back off. It's kind of like somebody, analogy, somebody who drives fast, typically drives fast. And then there's sometimes we're obviously speeding tickets, et cetera, et cetera. But um, in the analogy of like sport wise, everything, I believe it's a little bit easier to get somebody to get out of their comfort zone to go and take a few more chances um, than to have somebody who is always balls to the wall and, hey, you need to back off. Hey, you need to back off. Where if people have had good success with taking risks, everything, it's kind of hard to get them to be a little timid in their approaches. So, um, like my play style in softball, I have always been like a, a bigger risk taker. Okay. And things have actually panned out for me. So for somebody to say, hey, hey, slow down a little bit. So it's it's kind of hard to hear that. And um, when things have worked out that way for me, 
that's where I get along the train of thought, like, nope, go big or go home. And the beauty of it is in, in like my position in softball right now, I am the one who's supposed to go big. I'm designated the one to go in and home runs. You're, you're, every time. you're the slugger. I am the slugger. So when people tell me, Hey, you have to just hit a base hit. It's kind of, I kind of look at them a little crazy. Like, um, it's not my job and I need to take a big risk. And so, yeah, I, I would have to say getting somebody to take a little bit bigger of a chance than normal would be easier than have somebody. Take their foot off the gas. Okay. I, I think you make a valid case for that. Uh, I think uh, the caveat to that would be that it depends on the personality. Oh, or, 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 or the person, more specifically. Yes. Because they, they obviously already have a risk-taking personality. But And some people will take risks in some areas of, of sport and not in other areas. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like... I know this is a weird analogy, but it's a, I don't want to get sick. I have to, I have to have hand sanitizer. I have to clean everything, but they're willing to, you know, like drive 182 miles an hour or, you know, like take all the long shots in, in golf or, or whatever. So, yeah, it's just like mine. Um, in sport, I will take big risks, but when it comes to like my career and teaching, then I don't take those big risks in there. So, so uh, for our listeners, uh, Dan is a teacher. Yep, and you've been teaching for twenty years. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's 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 Time flies. That's, that's as long as I've known you. Pretty much. Wow. Yes. That's crazy. Yes. You're old. <laughs> Should I say you're older? Uh, if you would like, I don't <laughs> care. Not going to hurt my feelings. I know I'm older. That's what I keep um, telling my sister all the time. She keeps telling me I'm old, and I just keep reminding her you're, you're older. older. <laughs> uh, so, and, and and you teach uh, physical education and health. I did teach health for 15 years. I am now just straight physical education. Dan's the PE teacher. So, do you teach your kids golf? Uh, I do. Actually, we just got done about a month ago in our unit. Oh, cool. It is one of my favorite units to actually teach. So um, just to see the light bulbs start to click when students get a little success in it. Because golf is very uh, not a very popular sport. And especially in middle school age students, their typical response is, oh, that's for old people. Oh, that's for old people. Which predominantly it is an older age sport for popularity reasons. Um, but uh, I, I mean, getting young students involved in the game to enjoy it is one of the things that I take a very big pleasure in. Okay. And to see students going up there, uh, hacking at the ball. And then by the end of the unit, having a nice, pretty smooth swing and starting to see some success and smiles is the reason why I teach to begin with. But in golf, I see a lot of improvement. More so than your other like traditional sports of like football, basketball, or even um, just like cardiovascular of running and exercising and lifting. So I see the the biggest growth potential in golf. And that's why it's one of my favorites to teach. Plus, it's a passion of mine. Okay. Again, I mentioned this in the previous episode or recording with regular Dan, but uh, my nephew uh, played on his high school golf team from freshman year uh, through senior year. He was on the varsity team. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, he's shot under par uh, a couple of times at some of his tournaments, won some, lost some, that sort of thing. He, again, he's 19 or going to be 19 this year. So, you know, younger player playing golf. Right. Uh, But one of the things that I recall from, again, my high school days and, and that from the golf standpoint, you know, there's only like, what, six people on the team or um, so? When I was on my high school golf team, I was kind of similar situation as well. Pretty parallel to what you just stated. There was eight people who were during a match, their scores counted, but then there was six others that were trying to like get make the week. So yeah. they would go ahead and compete as well. And if their scores were better than the people that were in the competition, then the, the very next match, they would move up. So it was kind of interchangeable. Kind of a rotation. Or, yes. Or, or. So you, you shoot better, you make the team. You don't, you're kind of in exhibition. It's like tryouts every match. So it's like the English soccer league where – the, the the bottom two teams will be replaced by the top two teams from the lower league if they have better records okay, for the yes, next season good, yeah. or the next match. Yes. 
again, see, I'm not a big sports guy, but I know sports stuff. I didn't know where you're going it's first. Trivia minute, stuff. But, so. Yeah, I didn't know where you're going, but as soon as I understood it, yeah. yes, you're correct. So, and and again, golf is a solo sport. It's a team sport, obviously, as you were saying. Yeah, like the Ryder but, Cup. Right, yeah. but but your play does yeah. not depend on anybody else but your performance. Agreed. And the environment. It's a team collaborative effort at the end for scoring right, right, right. but it's all individual efforts that compromise which, it all. Which uh, and, and and I think for me, part of the reason that it's not as sexy, if you will, as <laughs> as, as football or I mean uh, uh, basketball or, or or baseball to a degree. How many times I hear um, people talking about sports and quote unquote sexy, but continue. I'm sorry, it's it's. A, cliched term that we use to describe the the attractive qualities of sport. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Please continue. But because they are team sports and, you know, a lot of people focus on them because, you know, if you can learn to work with a team, then you can go out into the world and how many times you're really truly going to be an individual person doing a thing and building the concept of, of, coordinating with others and trying to do things towards a common goal right. is, is is kind of what people tend to focus on with those sports. Yes. So golf, again, gives you kind of that loner mentality. And, and coming back to this movie, uh, Kevin Costner, while he's got his support peeps, mm-hmm. kind of a loner. Yes. I mean, you know, we got the caddy, which Romeo Cheech, mm-hmm. you know, plays, but ultimately – you know, in this movie, Kevin Costner is alone. Yes. Well, until he's not, you know, until Rene Russo shows up and he realizes that he is alone. So what I kind of wanted to talk about for a minute is Rene Russo, uh, just as an actress and in this movie. Uh, did you like her in this movie? I did. Do you like her in general? Not the hugest fan. Not really seen any movies that were outstanding with her that like kind of stick out in my mind. She's enjoyable to watch. Um, yeah. she's not very memorable. I like her in most of the movies that I've ever seen her in. She's an attractive woman. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, I mean, not that that's the qualifier. It's, just, it, it's, it's kind of a, like, she's an attractive woman in that sense, but she's also a good actress. So in a lot of the movies that you see her in, she's, and I hate to use the cliche, a chameleon, but she's not the same person over and over and over again. She's not typecast. She can play different characters. She can play over the top crazy, or she can play subtle crazy, which I think she does well in this movie, where she's got a little bit of the subtlety. Like what she has the little nuances that everything yeah. in in Tin Cup, yes. Yeah, and then you know, let's go to the MCU where she played Thor's mom. Yes. She can do the regal thing quite well. So mm-hmm. um, I, I, I respect her abilities as an actress. I think that's kind of where I was going. And you kind of threw I think, me for a loop on the, Thor, the Thor's mom. I, I forgot about that one. I couldn't get Lethal Weapon out of my head, where it was Mel Gibson's significant other yeah. love story in there. I couldn't get that out. And then when you, <laughs> when you threw the Thor's mom, I'm like, ooh, yeah. That's, that's right. right. She did the thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, again, yet again, this kind of supports my not really memorable for me. Okay. Well, I, I, I tend to notice when she's in movies, she's, she's not one, not my favorite actress in the whole world, but she's one of the ones that she's respectful. That, yeah. That, that I, that I tend to perk up and go, Oh, she's in this. Well, then it's got potential. Okay. Um, not that she hasn't been in bad movies, but, uh, you know, it's, 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 if, if, if she's in it, then at least I know there, there was probably going to be a good element. It's a potential movie. for it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Because I've seen plenty of movies that, that, the movie sucked. We're like, oh, but you know what? So and so was actually really good in this movie. If you catch what I'm saying, I do. So, uh, do you, as a sports guy, mm-hmm. and have you seen this? Because I think it's a cliche in sports movies. Is you got the really good athlete who hasn't learned to uh, manage his his approach, or hasn't accepted his full potential and and, and lived up to it yet, like. Kevin Costner's movie. Right. Do you find that there are cliches or is, is this a, a, an actual thing where those types of people have a posse, if you will, of people who are like just kind of, 
either hanging on because they know that this person could be great or they're just trying to be super supportive. Like, yeah, you could, you know, come on, man, you can do this. And they're just like the, the, the crew that was betting on what fly was going to hit the, the light first or, you know, like, Hey, we drove to see you at the US Open and we're right. going to Waffle House or whatever. You know, do you find that that's a, a, a cliche in sports movies? Or do you see that sort of thing happen with some of the folks that, you know, haven't lived up to their potential on the teams that you've been on or, or things like that? Um, for travel softball, I wouldn't really say it's a cliche. I would have to say I've seen it a lot, actually, in travel softball, where we have new upcomers who are young and dumb and think they know everything and... A lot of the more veteran experienced players see what this person has and hangs on and recruits them to play for them. And sometimes it doesn't pan out because their egos are too strong and they're just too stubborn to listen, to reason, to lay off the gas, as we've yeah. gone in unsaid numerous times. But there are some people that hang on and see potential in these people and become that supportive posse, like you said, and they turn out to be great. They turn, they, they listen to the wisdom, to the experience, and they develop into more potential, you know, bigger potential players. I mean, I probably am a living story of it a little bit where I was very young, dumb, um, way over energetic for it. Um, I had a little temperament issue <laughs> back then about swearing everything, but people, through like a lot of Hall of Fame players that I encountered in my softball career, grounded me a little bit more and learned. They basically taught me how to channel that in better ways. So, um, yeah, no, it, it's not a cliche. I've seen it a lot in sports, and I, I still think that there's a lot out there in professional sports where people are bad in the clubhouse. Um, it's my way or the highway. You see all these people. Um, well, they've been treated so special their entire lives that, uh, yes, you know, when, they're, when they're, in, they're put on a pedestal and when they're in a room full of other special people, they think they're the most special because their crap doesn't stink. Yeah, exactly. Yes. But you see people throughout, like in their rookies and, you know, they start getting successful and they get these big contracts and then they're too big for their britches. And then by the end of their career, they're humbled and they are a little bit more respectful. Take Tom Brady, for instance. I mean, he's a very loved or hated athlete. Well, at the beginning of his career, he was very, very cocky. Yeah. Very non-humbled, um, like um, the greatest thing in the world. But if you see his interviews now, he's a lot more humbled and he's very respectful and thankful for the game. And <laughs> like well, Durham, he learned the cliches, you know, I just like to thank God for giving me the opportunity to play the game. Oh boy, I hate uh, that as an athlete. <laughs> I hate that. And I know that's what they're trained to say, but come on. But no, it is. I don't think it's a cliche. I think it is a real thing that you see in... Different contexts, um, not exactly as in this tin cup. Where the, yeah, the and that's, and that's the, the thing. Where, yeah, because I think uh, I think the the purpose of Kevin Costner's posse in this movie is to keep him again grounded in a less uh, psychological way. They're the ones that'll make fun of him, like yeah, 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 like yeah, you're awesome. But remember that time you you. Know, hit the tree or, or whatever, you know, that is a good way. Yes. To home. Yeah. They're there to remind him of his flaws. Uh, even though he recognizes that his flaws, uh, you know, he thinks his flaws are strengths about again, the, the, the complete and total balls to the wall all the time and the inability right. to lay up, you know, and take the safe shot, you know, as, as they say in this movie, sometimes it's better to go for par than, than the double bogey because, you know, at least you can live to fight another day. Right. Yeah, you know, and 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 it took, <clears throat> again. It took him a while to learn that. One of the low level sub story or subplots about this, I guess, is uh, sports psychology and getting into your head. Mm. So, mm -hmm. 
his first day at the Open, he shoots the course record. And when I say the course record, it's like, yeah, no one's ever shot an 87 during the, you know, 83, I think it was, during the U.S. Open. Uh, he, he apparently made the cut, so he was able to go to the next day or whatever. Right. That's fine. And then the next day, he shoots the course record. Like, oh, my God, he shot a 57 or whatever the hell it was. 57 or 59, I can't remember. Yeah, so, be something exact. something ridiculous. Yeah, It was like, oh, my God, no one's ever done that before. Which is um, extremely difficult, yes. Do you see that in sport, the in their head or out of their head? Oh, where 100%. Just- As being the catcher in my softball, it is my job to get in people's heads. And, um, it, it, yes, it is all the time. You see it in sports, people trash talking, um, making gestures, taunting, um, like basketball is one of them where, um, they're kind of like, it's not the good thing to do, but stand over them when they dunk on them, (laughs) everything. (laughs) Yes, it doesn't really work out well, but. Yeah, psychology, like psychology wise of getting in people's head and psyching them out. Oh, that's, that is prevalent in sports. Yeah, but, but the other aspect of it is not even so much the getting in people's heads. It's the getting in your own head. Oh, the, very well. I have been my own worst enemy at numerous times. Yeah, where- and, 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 and I think, again, I think this movie does a really good job of capturing a lot of the essence of sports. Yes. In the sense that, you know, when you get into your head, it affects your performance. Well, the chili dip. Yeah. Where he has the shanks, as they mm-hmm. call it. Yeah. Where he, he couldn't hit it right. He was always headed off the hosel of the golf club. And he kept tin cup. Kept, Dan knows the parts of the golf club. I have no idea. That's where the, the golf head I don't, meets, okay. the, meets the shaft of the club. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyways. Um <laughs> But that's where Romeo is basically there and uses Rene Russo to try and get him out of his own head. So that's where the therapist kind of comes in and, and yeah. yet again but, and works that little love triangle all, yeah. all together. And then when they're, when they're at the practice range getting ready for the open, he's like, all right, hey, shift your, shift your change to your other pocket. You know, blah, 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 just to blah, get blah, 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 off of it. Yes. Yeah. He's like, uh-huh. well, now I feel like an idiot. He's like, yeah, but you're not thinking about your swing now. You know, play golf, damn you. Yeah, um, pretty much. Yes. You know, and it makes sense. And, and, and again, I'm not, you know, to your level of competitive sport. Uh, but I know, like, you know, on my Thursday bowling nights that, you know, if I get in my head, if I can't get out of my head, oh boy. my game is going to suck. I've been there and that's where I used to swear a lot. Um, I usually leave it out on the lane. Yeah. And then I'll get back and sit at the table with my teammates and go, Okay, well, that sucked. Hold on. <sighs> yeah, okay. there's, a, there's a running joke yeah. for my softball team and a lot of other teams that I play against where now if I make a mistake, I just yell at my name. It's a little bit better. So I was, Daniel. So that's where I would do it. And that's where a lot of people <laughs> do you ever even know when they read name treatment. I mean, you get your full name. Um, when it was like the game is on the line and I, I mess up. Yeah. Because, you know, growing up when you had your middle name called by like somebody. Oh, yeah. Mom, yeah, yeah, dad, yeah. Authority figure. You're like, oh, crap. I'm in trouble. Yeah. As soon as like the middle name, like Dan. Nope. Time for dinner. I'm good. <laughs> Daniel. Time for dinner. No. <laughs> Daniel Patrick Hart. Got to go. Uh, I got to roll. <laughs> All right. Never mind. Yeah. Good. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways. All right. Well, uh, well um, we're, at, we're at about an hour. It's a good conversation. Was there anything that you think we missed about this movie? Because, I mean, we covered the sports aspect of it a lot. No, we Sports covered- therapy, uh, actors, actresses. Um, no, I don't think there's anything that we I, I wanted to add on. Um, it's a very enjoyable movie. It has nice little twists. It has um, the little typical love story that comes into it with yeah. like, the little twist and the... The movie magic convenience of, oh, just happened to be his nemesis, Don Johnson. Yeah. Dun, girlfriend. Dun, dun. <laughs> yes, of course. But, I mean, in the end, where, like, they're all sleeping together and Kevin Costner, it's not always going to be like this. And she just basically states, yes, it will. Um, those are all, like, the happy-go-lucky good feels. Yeah. Like, things are, you know, the universe is right. Yeah, yes. yeah. All is well. But, but you know, and, and, and there's a thing in there where, you know, you get your mind right, get your life right, get your sport right. You know, right. Or, or, or your job. I mean, whatever it is. Right. So, yes. Uh, it makes perfect sense. Uh, I, I did want to ask one question. This is more not specifically about Tin Cup, okay. uh, but for you. Oh, uh, because I – well, yeah. <laughs> um, because, one, uh, you, you've played the baseball, you play the softball. Mm-hmm. Um I know how you feel about For Love of the Game. 
Yeah, uh, another Kevin Costner movie. Phenomenal it's, movie. It's not his only baseball movie because Bull Durham. Yeah. So when I think of Kevin Costner sports movies, there are four that I think of, and they are three baseball, one golf. Correct. Tin cup. Okay. For love of the game, which you've already mentioned, phenomenal. Bull Durham. Yep. Which we've already mentioned, mm-hmm. and Field of Dreams. So Kevin Costner in sports movies is almost a cliche in and of itself because they're <laughs> usually the same movie kind of over and over. I mean, to a, to a degree. And uh, uh, yeah, follow me no. through on this uh, because, you know, you, you always introduce the sports cliches. Got it. That happens. You know, oh, thank God. Yay. I was able to score the touchdown. You know, or if you want to uh, borrow uh, uh, McKenna's like, well, we sported better than they sported. And at the end, the sports ball sported uh, enough sport to, to win the sport. So we sported. Yay, sports. <laughs> McKenna's not a big fan. Uh, but uh, yeah, so Field of Dreams. He is a baseball fan. Yes. Uh, Bull Durham. He's the wise old mentor. Agreed. To uh, Tim Robbins' character. Yeah. Yes, he's got his own issues. But, you know, he's there to mentor new the, 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 yes, exactly. The, the new hot pitcher right. so that he can Million go to the big, so he can go to the show. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then for love of the game, he is a pitcher at the end of his career and doesn't want to give it up. Agreed. So he does a great job in all four of these movies covering the dispar- different aspects of athletes in their careers or again spectators like i love the game but do you think that kevin costner's sports movies are representative of like the true heart of sport um i think for the love of game yes um tin cup yes i would have to say overall yeah there's all different aspects in each of these movies that are highlighted but yeah i would have to overall in, in general, say yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. I, I agree. I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, again, uh, I, I did play football in high school. I, I weighed about the buck. Still do. Well, I'm at about a buck 50 now, but yeah. Well, so. You can make change from $2. I'm, I'm proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> but for me, it was you know, like, there, there's, like, I don't know, let's give it a shot. Let's see what happens. Let's see what I can do. Kind right. of thing. You know, I, I knew I was never going to be you know, in the NFL or, or even, you know, playing at a collegiate level. It's like, yeah, okay, well, I had fun and I, you know, gave it a shot. Played it. any sports that I've done have always just been, like, for fun, for love of the game, you know, because I, I recognize that it's a game, but there's also a certain degree of self-competitiveness. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, Roy McAvoy in this character, I don't know that he's really competitive with himself. I mean, he is... Like I need to make this, I need to make this, and I don't know if that if that's just ego getting in the way, uh, but that's a good you know. thought to ponder about that last basically go for it, foot on the gas, scene. Yeah. like I'm going to make the shot, you know, and Romeo hands him the last ball, we'll make it count, yeah, and he goes in. So I don't know if that's the true competitive nature inside of himself or is just ego going, nope, I'm going to do this no matter what. I'm not yeah. letting my foot off the gas. I'm not going to learn my lesson, kind of scenario. Uh, but but my point in saying that is uh, is you know I, I think one of the benefits of of, of sport uh, is learning to control your competitiveness so that you can temper it and, and and actually do as this movie espouses learn when to lay up or when to let off the gas a little bit right so so with that uh, we will be talking about. Where this movie would go on your shelf, if you did own it, Mm -hmm. where would you rank this? And again, I've done this with other guests that I've had. If you look downstairs, all of our movies are alphabetical, so they're not really in any particular, you know, like genre genre or or ranking order. But if you if you had top shelf being you know, like liquor, these are my best movies. These are the ones I go ah, to. Okay. Uh, bottom shelf being like, yeah, I'm not really sure why I own this, but it exists and I guess it's there. Or even, you know, if you watch another movie like that's hot garbage. So, and then, you know, third shelf being somewhere in the middle, whatever. Uh, where would you put this on your shelf? Um, on I your would shelves? Have probably just for the ones that I own, everything I would have to probably say it would be like the third shelf because 
I'm a very, the ones that I do own, I am a very big fan. They're like the Lord of the Rings trilogy with the hobbits as well in there. And then all of the star Wars. And that's pretty much all I have. Oh, I lied. I do have the matrix trilogy as well too. So, so you're kind of a sports geek kind of combo kind of thing. That's, 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 I, yes, I'm, I'm full out sports kind of quote unquote jockish. You're, the, you're, you're like inner, the jock nerd. I have my inner nerd in me as well. too. Yeah. That's so, interesting. That's yes. Interesting. Um, I have been told I'm quite confusing. <laughs> when it comes down to it. But hey, well, you like you know, what you like. Hey, yeah, no, I agree wholeheartedly. Yes. And, and it's interesting because the historical battles uh, in, in high school as depicted oh, in movies versus is jocks versus oh, nerds. Oh, yes. And, and you're, 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 you're the crossover guy. Well, I was always the type of person in high school that I was always involved in sports. But I mixed, if you're good to me, I'm good to you. Um, people were scared of all the burnouts. I was, I was friends with them. Um, we had like some of our quote unquote gang members in our school and just happened to be one of my locker partners that I had to share with. I was cool with them. Oh, the nerds. I treated, you treat me respectfully. I treat you respectfully. Nice. Nice. Okay. So, uh, with all of that being said, listeners, uh, if you're listening to this, then you might want to listen to the other episode because we've already pushed the random magic movie button and that one's going to tell you what movie we're doing for episode 49. Uh, I would like to hear if you have any movies you'd like to add to random listener review selected list. And if you want to contact us, you can drop by the Facebook page. You can hit us up on Twitter. Yeah. You can send us an email at W R I O S. 2016MR at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail at 804-699-1067. Um, so normally regular Dan does a movie themed goodbye, but I don't want you to steal his thunder. So this is the part of the podcast where we say thank you very much. And uh, I would say see you in two weeks, but you're going to get another episode in about a week and then we will uh, release our episode 49 as well. So thank you for having me. I was just about to close with thank you very much for being here. And I really yes. appreciate you doing this. With this me. was fun. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome.